a.m. And this is a meeting of Senate Natural Resources and Energy. We are resuming our work on Bill H-126, Community Resilience and Biodiversity Protection. So um, last week, we took a lot of testimony, but we didn't, we didn't have a chance to hear from everyone. Um, in particular, Ms. Oates and her team talking to us about the uh, aquatic issue or lands related to aquatic uh, areas. So uh, we're going to finish testimony there. Um, and also, uh, as people might recall, we asked the different stakeholders to continue work outside the committee and come back with consensus language if they could get there. And uh, it seems as though they have. So Mr. Martin will walk us through that. Um, and then we have one other uh, citizen uh, checking in with us, Mr. Gibson. So uh, to get started, I'd like to go to uh, uh, Ms. Bergman. Good morning. Is she on the... Yeah. There we go. Well, she was. Good morning. morning. Good morning. So I'm looking at the screen up there and it says Brenda Gale. Yes. And I have our, my witnessless friend of Bergman. So how would you like to be addressed, please? Thank you. You can just call me Brenda. Um, Gail is my middle name. Okay, thank you. So um, yeah, if you could, uh, the, the floor is yours. We love to hear from you. All right, well, first, thank you so much for making the time um, and for your careful attention to this topic. So my name is Brenda Gail Bergman, and I am the Director of Science and Fresh Water at the Nature Conservancy here in Vermont. And over the past two years, I've been coordinating a working group statewide that's been exploring the questions that we're discussing today. What does it mean to conserve our waters? How do we advance this in Vermont, given our unique conditions in the state? And I can tell you that there's great interest, momentum, and support for the topics that we're discussing today. So I'd like to address three considerations. Um, one, conserving water is essential to achieving the aims of H-126, community resilience and biodiversity protection. Two, almost 200 countries, including the United States, have articulated real clear commitments to conserving lands and waters. And we're strongly suggesting that Vermont should follow that lead. And three, our current mechanisms in Vermont for conserving waters and stewarding our waters are helpful but insufficient at present. So this addition within this bill would be extremely valuable to the state. My colleague Tara, who has been deeply engaged in related policy efforts internationally, was planning to testify also, but she's no longer available due to a, our schedule change. So uh, my colleague Lauren and I will incorporate some of her points into our testimony today. Thank you. Okay. So the first point that inclusion of water is essential. Um, so uh, yeah, as we all know, H-126 by its title is about community resilience and biodiversity protection. If we're to achieve either of those, we must conserve our waters. And I'm just gonna give you a couple reasons or examples why. So in terms of resilience, uh, freshwater ecosystems are providing services that are really essential to the resilience of our communities. As we all know, drinking and irrigation water, food security, flood risk and drought risk reduction, pollution control, carbon sequestration and storage, of th mostly through our wetlands. Um, and the greatest natural hazard challenging our resilience here in Vermont is flooding and associated erosion risks. Our rivers really need better conservation, though there are a lot of great people you know, with the great intent working on it, but also legal protections and conservation to mitigate flood risk. Approximately 75% uh, of all of our assessed river miles in our state are disconnected from their floodplains. So that gives us a sense of the condition, um, that there's a lot of good work to be done, and that that also exacerbates the flood-related damages because it allows these high flows of water during flood times to rush downstream rather than dissipating that energy on the landscape. Um, and can I ask a quick question? 
question there? Sorry to interrupt. Um, yes. Did you just say 75% of <laughs> our river miles are disconnected from their floodplains? Of the ones that have, yes, sir. Uh, of the ones that have been assessed by the Vermont DEC, uh, they've assessed approximately a quarter of all of our river miles. And from those data, um, about 75% are disconnected, yes. And is that because of channelization? It's from a variety of factors, historical factors, land use and channel mismanagement. Um, so yes. Okay, thank you. Sure, thanks for the question. Um, so yeah, and flood related impacts as we know are also a real financial consideration for our state. They cost Vermont taxpayers millions of dollars in damages whenever a flood, a large flood occurs. So that's the resilience piece. Um, on the biodiversity piece, you know, freshwater ecosystems are among the most biodiverse ecosystems on our planet. They have the greatest species diversity per unit area compared to marine or terrestrial biomes. Um, at the same time, our most drastic biodiversity losses are in freshwater uh, monitored vertebrate populations in freshwater, they've gone down by 83% globally since, you know, in a lot of our lifetimes since 1970. And this is much far greater than the rate of decline on lands and in the oceans. And Vermont provides critical freshwater habitat. We're a unique, um, <coughs> we're in a unique place for cold water species, us and some of our neighboring states you know, such as our beloved brook trout, uh, whose viability is declining in southern extents of their range under a changing climate. So the habitats that we steward for them are really important, not just for us, but for, for some of these species as a whole. So that was uh, about resilience and biodiversity related to H126. And my second point was about the fact that many other governments have committed to conserving freshwater ecosystems at the same level as terrestrial and marine. So the United States has, as you know, committed to conserving 30% of our waters by 2030 through executive order 14008 in January, 2021. And that launched the associated initiative called America the Beautiful. And like Vermont, several other states are following suit with their own initiatives for conserving lands and waters, including New York, Michigan, Nevada, California. And just recently, um, 187 governments adopted a global biodiversity framework. This was just last December. And that established explicit targets to restore and protect fresh water. It's called the coming Montreal framework. <clears throat> so for example, there's a range of targets specific to fresh water, but one is that by 2030, at least 30% of our inland water areas are effectively conserved and managed. So these commitments are being established up front, allowing the detailed approaches of how and where to be later articulated during the planning stages. So for example, for the global biodiversity framework, a community of freshwater experts is working together now to deliver the guidance for implementing the commitments that have already been made to conserve 30% of our waters. And so our recommendation is that Vermont follow suit that this approach makes a lot of sense. And um, my third point and final point is that our current mechanisms in the state are helpful, but insufficient to conserving waters. Um, so the previous, rate, the previous rate I mentioned of freshwater biodiversity decline, it's really uh, precipitous. And I just wanted to see if I could quickly share with you my screen just to see it on a graph. Um, yeah, the graph. Okay. So let me see if I can do this without taking much of your time here, just because it's really helpful to uh, see what it looks like. For me, every time I look at this, it's just shocking. So this is a graph showing 
1970 to 2020, when we, and this is the rate of um, freshwater biodiversity decline. So we look, we're really going quickly down towards zero if we continue business as usual. But one of the things that I love about this particular um, depiction is that we also have a bending the curve up. You know, we can envision what it can be like if we all do our part to really be take this seriously and invest and commit to conserving our waters and not stumble waiting for us to have all the answers before we make those commitments. Because when we make the commitments, it really mobilizes us to get very serious about it. So just wanted to share that with you. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing here. And I'm almost done just to wrap this up. Um, so we're seeing how urgent it is to bend that curve in the other direction. Uh, one in three freshwater species are threatened with extinction globally. And here in Vermont, there was a recent climate assessment that found that climate change further threatens our water availability, quality, and flows in our state. So going into the future, uh, the conditions that we're operating in will make it more important that we take this seriously because it will be more difficult due to, to climate change. And so while land conservation is such an important step, um, attributes essential to the resilience and biodiversity of our freshwater systems can't be maintained only through land conservation. We will only achieve the aims of H126 biodiversity conservation and resilience by committing to conserving our waters also. So we would love it if we could start by explicitly including waters in the goals of H126, following the lead of the United States and almost 200 other countries. Thank you for your time and all of everything you're doing. Thank you. Uh, any committee questions for Ms. Gatt? Senator White and Senator Clark. Uh, thank you, Chair Bray. So I thought when you were gonna show a graph, you were gonna show the one in, um, Tara Moberg's testimony with the freshwater species decline, which is very concerning as well. And looks like it follows the same trend that you've shown. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you, you had mentioned that having it be clear goals, that that's the first step to actually starting the process of protecting these species. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to um, other countries or other localities that have done this and if they've started to see that springboard back with some of the species that we're talking about? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And we actually do see, depending on the system, but we see some great responses when we really uh, do some steps that, that we all know are tried and true, but we just haven't been able to pull them together for various reasons. But giving species the ex ability to move and to access their floodplains and, all, and reduce the kind, we do start to see some pretty amazing responses actually in some systems. Uh, it really depends on the unique situation of that system. But for example, in some wetland species, uh, we can see responses very quickly. You know, and in Vermont, you know, we'll even, even in some of the projects that we're doing here in Vermont, uh, just very small scale, when you take some of these actions uh, that are, that we're recommending around conservation and restoration, you start to see a response you know, an initial response very quickly. So that's one of the really exciting things about uh, working in aquatic conservation. It's not um, like it's going to rapidly and suddenly all be better, but we will see signs that are very encouraging as we move forward and relatively quickly. Thank you. Senator McCormick? Uh, do you have language that you'd like to recommend to us? Yes, and my colleague Lauren will be sharing some information on that. So we do. And uh, on the issue of, of the rivers being disconnected from their floodplains, is that the science on that I think is pretty solid. That this is more of a public relations issue at this point. Is that more as a conviction among people who live along the rivers that rip wrapping is a good thing? It is, it, I, I see that as more of a public relations thing. I think the science, the policy is really already settled. Yes. 
Yes, the science is astounding to say that we really need this connection of our rivers and our floodplains. And also our state has committed, you know, recognized that in, in the way that we're, our rivers management um, is happening through DEC. It's just that we haven't yet been able to achieve it to the levels that everyone would like for all the reasons, many of the reasons that you're mentioning in terms of public relations and others. Yeah, yeah as, as a legislator, I'm sort of, we are a bridge between the government that does the governing yeah. and the people in whose behalf the government is acting. I, I, I've spent years basically getting scolded and yelled at for the fact that the state won't let us manage the river better. And then that's that, I think, is the widespread public attitude. I appreciate it. Yeah, go ahead, please. I'm sorry, I didn't know that you were continuing. Was there anything else that you wanted to complete? I wasn't. <laughs> I'm done. It's a really important point. I would say that um, and, and thank you for all that you've been doing at that interface with the public. Uh, we've recognized also, and many other partners, the importance of engaging with the public in a meaningful way. In fact, when I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, uh, this conserving waters work that we've been doing, one of the three pillars is really around community engagement. And we've been meeting with partners who are also doing community engagement work around water to say, how can we, you know, get even get better, even though there's good work ongoing in the state at really meeting people where they're at when we talk about these things and hearing from communities and framing the work and engaging them in a way that will build momentum and excitement around the potential for conserving our waters and for things that we can all do, such as how we manage our riverbanks on our properties. And we're, we're seeing... Um, it's, it, it's exciting because we're seeing energy around that. And we're seeing that, you know, if it's hard to ask you alone to be the representative of all of these things. <laughs> but if we can get more of us um, on the same page and a coordinated mechanism for really engaging communities and meeting them where they're at, that's already happening with a lot of our great local organizations. But just to let you know that um, we're here to support you and that it's not only TNC, but many partners in that journey. So thank you. I have a, a question. I don't know if it's uh, more, if it's something you want to address or Ms. Oates, but um, uh, in terms of when we have this conversation, uh, I'm trying to be more clear in my own mind about what we're talking about. If we're talking about <clears throat> the waters themselves, the, the critters that live in those waters, the adjoining land, whether that's uh, a riverbank or a floodplain or a wetland. Um, and so the, the scope, I know they're all integrated and interdependent, but when we talk about conservation, um, I want to try to be more clear in my own mind about what we're taking on. And part of that's motivated by the fact that we hold the waters themselves in public trust. Um, so I, this may or may not be accurate. I think of them as conserved in that way, that they're owned by, held by all of us. So I'm um, to get a little more clarity on that this morning. And I don't know if that's a question for you or Ms. Oates, who's in the on-deck circle here. Yeah, thank you. So that is a question that we know is really important to you. And uh, Ms. Oates was planning to discuss this in her testimony. So I might defer to her for now, but I'm very happy to come back and discuss the public trust. Um, I'm happy to discuss it now if you prefer as well. But it is a really, I would just say in briefly that watersheds and lands that flow into the waters held in the public trust are not protected by the public trust. And so, so the land directly adjacent to the water, for example, which is essential to this biodiversity and resilience is not protected. And that's one of the main considerations here. Um, and, and we can get into it in more detail after Ms. Oates' testimony, if that's helpful. Sure, thanks very much. Um, any other committee questions? Okay, great. Thanks again for your testimony this morning. Thank you so much. And, and you're welcome to stay on, or if you'd like to leave and go do other things. We, we have guests who come and go, so don't feel compelled to hang in here with us.
Thank you. The, the reason I'm virtual and not in person is I do have another meeting, but I'm going to stay here up until the time I have to leave. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Um, with that, let's uh, go to results. Good morning. Thank you for coming back. I don't think I've ever heard my colleague Brenda call me this one before. No. A couple times over. Uh, it's good to be back. Uh, for the record, Lauren Oates, Director of Government Relations and Policy with the Nature Conservancy in Vermont. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen just as a backdrop uh, to a graphic that Senator White just mentioned, um, just to kind of let that be the backdrop to my testimony today. Um, I was here last week, you might all remember, immediately prior to that lovely fire drill that we had. Yes. Um, I have notes that I was prepared to share there. Uh, most importantly, a recognition that several of the senators around the table were wearing blue in light of blue conservation. Thank you to Senator Watson and the chair for continuing that trend here today. Um, <laughs> so chair, we, the Nature Conservancy worked with uh, Mr. Martin and others at your request last week and over the weekend to come to some consensus language that he's going to share later. Um, but because currently the bill before you does not include aquatic language, I just wanna go ahead and wrap up uh, the case that Brenda just made uh, and the case that several others who are planning to provide testimony to make sure that this committee can really grapple with the issues in that file. Um, and happy to answer any questions. I'm glad that um, Dr. Bergman is staying on uh, so that she can answer any questions that are more appropriate for her. Um, so last week you heard from several people um, and I was taking a tally during testimony that every single person that testified on H126 last week mentioned water uh, multiple times over and the importance of our aquatic systems. I'll note that <coughs> the pictures that were shared in testimony had photos of salamanders and wood turtles and other species that require <coughs> aquatic habitat, even if they have a terrestrial component as well. So we have this implicit understanding of the importance of aquatic habitat, but it is often overlooked in explicit language and statute. So that's what I'm hoping to discuss and convey today. Um, in addition to the graph that I just shared as part of my testimony, I submitted Last week, I also have a one-pager uh, case for support for water conservation that was supported by organizations that make up the Water Caucus in Vermont. It also covers a bit of the public trust doctrine uh, debate, which I'll get to too, if it makes sense to continue that. Um, it's Thank digital, you. but I have hard copies if you want them. Um, just to say that this isn't just a Nature Conservancy-led effort that um, the other organizations in the state yeah. recognize this need to. Um, prior to last week, actually, I want to give credit to my close friend and colleague, Chris Campany at the London Regional Commission, who was the first to say yes. this bill is missing aquatic habitat, and please consider including it. Uh, it is essential for both biodiversity protection and community resilience is the title of this bill. Um, I, I just want to acknowledge that we tried several times over in the House version of the bill to get it in, uh, but given timing and continued questions around what do we mean when we say conserved waters, we weren't uh, we weren't able to get it in the House version. So we're really hoping we can get it in here. A couple of data points that I wanted to share. Uh, not and that you, you have. Sorry, I'm remembering that we also uh, tried to add this last year yes. but we the session was ending and we couldn't work through it so I'm glad that we're making a second pass and figuring it out yeah it was, that was also yeah an 11th hour attempt on h606 last year in the thanks for that reminder um so a couple of things that i wanted to point out uh first i'm probably going to echo a couple of things that dr bergman said uh, in that I, I want to pull in some of Tara Moberg's uh, testimony since she was unable to be here this week. She's traveling internationally for work, which sounds really fun. Um, as well as Dr. Beverly Wemple, who was also intended to testify. She is a professor of uh, geological sciences at the University of Vermont, uh, with her permission to provide some language on her behalf today since she was not able to make it. Um, so you've heard before, uh, that more than half of Vermont's threatened and endangered species are aquatic or aquatic adjacent. Towns right now have their salamander teams out and about trying to make sure that they can make road crossings. I, I have 
on my front porch forum as well as an email this morning called action from our friends at the Vermont Land Trust. So it's happening now. Um, three quarters of our rivers are disconnected from our floodplains as Dr. Bergman just shared. Flooding is our number one natural hazard in the state and it is going to worsen with climate change as models are already showing as the Vermont Climate Assessment 2021 captured. Uh, our state uh, climatologist, Dr. Leslie Andy Kamijaru, actually calls uh, it's not a flooding problem in Vermont, it's actually a hydro problem in Vermont, that we're going to have periods of drought uh, and then periods of heavy flooding, and it's going to kind of oscillate between those two. So, All right. so there is a significant component that our water systems play in our community resilience. I think we Aside from simultaneous Michael. flooding in Wyndham County and drought in Memorial. Yes, yes. Last year especially was incredibly stark, the differences across the state. Um, I have uh, a couple of things to share, but I'll just hold in case there are questions on it. I want to go through this relatively quickly. So uh, Mr. Martin has had to share our language. Um, I want to acknowledge that this is not just a Vermont problem. Grappling with water-based conservation and protecting our freshwater systems is a global problem, as Dr. Bergen mentioned. A couple more statistics if you're not sick of hearing them. Um, inland waters cover less than 2% of Earth's surface, but they support 12% of Earth's known species, including over half of all fish species. A 1997 estimate concluded that they provide six and a half trillion dollars in annual services a year. I don't know what that would mean with inflation now, but let's assume it's a lot more than six and a half trillion. Yet almost one in three known freshwater species is threatened with extinction due to connectivity loss, conversion, drainage, flow alteration, pollution, and invasive species. Freshwater species have declined by 83% since 1970. Migratory fish have declined by 76% and aquatic megafauna by 88%. This is all since 1970. Less than one fifth of the world's pre industrial wetlands remain intact. Plans for dams threaten, threaten free flowing status of over nearly 300,000 kilometers of rivers globally. 90% of global natural disasters relate to water. There is an expected increase in 50% of the global demand for water by 2030. Uh, and peatland drainage, we do have peatland in Vermont, accounts for 4% of anthropogenic global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so the conversion of those releases a significant amount into our atmosphere. So there's that climate resilience and adaptation component to consider as well. I'll get to the public trust doctrine, but I wanted to first, again, with permission from Dr. Wemple, um, pull out a couple of quotes from the testimony that she wanted just to be spoken today um, for the benefit of the committee and public listening in. Uh, again, she's a professor of geography and geosciences at the University of Vermont. She's been working there since the 90s. Um, a couple of quotes that I think are relevant um, from her. The bill's commitment to setting a conservation vision and goal is important is an important first step for Vermont, but she is deeply concerned that protection of our vulnerable aquatic systems is absent from the state's conservation goals as outlined in H-126. This is a fundamental and glaring oversight that could have profound impacts on the next several decades of conservation planning and investment, which in turn will have profoundly negative impacts on our already distressed water and watershed. As a direct quote, um, and finally, enacting a vision to, quote, maintain an ecologically functional landscape, uh, that's the vision of this title, as well as uh, Vermont conservation design, without specifically calling out protections for water, will not allow us to meet the challenges we face in society. So those are just a couple of things to pull it out again. Um, I have... Um, a couple of more things to share from um, Tara Mover's testimony, including um, including the public trust doctrine issue. Happy to answer any questions around that. But I just want to hammer home one final point that Dr. Bergman just made, which is that we know how to conserve land. We in Vermont have done a really good job. We have significant work we need to do in that realm, hence this bill. Uh, but the title of this bill is not land conservation plan mm -hmm. for Vermont. The title of this bill is biodiversity protection and community resilience. We cannot do either of those things 
without aquatic habitat included. The global community recognizes that our states that are leading this effort to include Vermont by, by, by the end of this session will include goals for lands and waters. Um, treating freshwater ecosystems as part of the terrestrial realm has resulted in their neglect. We say we conserve the land around the water, so the water must be good to go. That is clearly based on the statistics we've been sharing, not true. Uh, this impacts the extent, management, effectiveness, and resilience of freshwaters connected and conserved areas. Um, this insufficiency, this is from uh, Ms. Bober's testimony, derives from the fact that healthy functioning of freshwater ecosystems depends on a combination of what we'll call key ecological attributes uh, from hydrologic regime, connectivity, physical habitat, biocomposition, and more. Um, and you'll see that we've recommended some language changes to the bill that acknowledge that. Um, I, I have so much more to say, but I think I'm just going to wrap because I think we've made a pretty clear case here today. Um, I'll close with the public trust doctrine if you'd like, Chair. Um, and then, great, okay. Um, happily, or perhaps not, uh, this is an issue that the global community is also wrestling with. Um, so I'm going to pull from Tara and then bring it home to Vermont. Um, she says in her testimony uh, that was submitted again digitally, because I understand it's material to this committee's deliberations, she wanted to note that countries party to the COP15 biodiversity framework uh, as well as a lot of states that are doing 30 by 30 initiatives in their state houses have public trust doctrines um, under which waters or other natural resources are held in trust by the sovereign or state. In and of themselves, the public trust doctrines do not qualify resources to, towards the 30% goal under the global biodiversity framework, as they do not satisfy the definition of protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures to explicitly include waters. In addition, from the conversations that she's been having with these international parties, um, they consider that it's explicitly including waters in 30 by 30 goals um, as being in conflict with or redundant to their public trust doctrines has proven inaccurate, and rather they view these goals and their required participa participatory planning processes. Wow, that's a lot of keys, Tara as proactive framework uh, for articulating and managing resources collectively for the benefit of people now and into the future. And as Dr. Bergman just said, though we are protect, though we protect our the water molecules in our systems, we don't protect those that flow down from our lands. Um, and it has clearly remained uh, insufficient to protect our water systems and aquatic habitat in the state. I'll close with that plea. Um, I'm happy to cover the aquatic language, unless Mr. Martin wants to cover all of it in one fell swoop. Um, if, if it's okay, I think I'd ask Mr. Martin to present the whole document as so, well. But uh, I'd be happy to pause while we do that if you want to call things out or offer comments. We can do some back and forth. Um, uh, so, let me pause and just say, are there any three questions? And I'm not sure who will answer this. And I'm not sure exactly how this fits into the discussion, but I live on the main branch of the White River, upstream of the confluence with the third branch. Okay. Well, okay, so it's a fair, it's a clean river. Yeah. And it's one of the clean, it's unusually clean. It's not perfect. And it gets kind of funky and odd. <laughs> uh, okay. I still, you can still swim that, but you know, you want to make sure you don't swallow it. Uh, what I think about is when you talk about taking care of the river, taking care of the waters, are we talking mainly about actions we need to take, or are we talking about um, passivity, about actions we need to avoid taking? What I'm thinking about is, is um, hiking in the national forest weeks after I read it mm -hmm. and saying to myself, what, what disaster? Yeah. And then it's, oh, well, actually what I'm looking at is exactly what I was looking at and the disaster, except it's not a disaster. It's just the forest that had a flood, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and now it's all right. It, you know, things get knocked out of place. That's what happens every now and then. Mm -hmm. And so then we have built ourselves very vulnerable. We've made ourselves vulnerable to the world. Yeah. 
So it seems to me that a lot of what can be done, the National Forest survives a lot of because they didn't put stuff there to get wrecked. Okay, so anyway, but is it, or are there things we need to actually do? I, I would argue, and I and invite Brenda to jump in if she's listening in, that it's a both and. There are certain things that we need to stop doing, um, like putting in dams, uh, adding fills where floodplains, further channelizing our rivers, which exacerbates flooding and water quality, among others. Um, but it's also taking proactive steps by not doing anything in those areas that are functioning healthy. And you're right, the hiking, I mean, the, the state and others, you, know, you probably know as Vermonters, uh, recommend not hiking until after Memorial Day weekend so that the snow has time to melt and the water to kind of really get seeped into the yeah, ground yeah. and not create water quality issues that early on in the season prior to the funk of August, as you said. Um, so there are, yeah, there are um, individual actions that can be taken, there are policy actions that can be taken, um, and I'm really hopeful that by including language for aquatic habitat um, in the goals and throughout the rest of this plan, or this bill rather, the conservation planning process is really going to grapple with the questions that you're asking and come up with the best solutions for us. Just one, the field between my house and the White River. It was often cited as a disaster during Irene because we didn't get inundated the current of the river came mm -hmm. and there were refrigerators floating across the field. So, and I've come to realize that, that that was not a disaster at all. The field did exactly what you were hoping it would. It would, yeah. And because there was no development in the way, it could retain yeah. those waters and let the energy disperse. No terrible permanent damage was done to that field. Aside from picking up. Refrigerators. Yeah. A lot of them. Um, no, the refrigerators went that all the way down. It left almost, it left some wood. It did leave some wood. Yeah. Those refrigerators landed somewhere. They landed somewhere, yeah. But, but I mean, that's the, the idea that the, there was a place for the water to go that, mm -hmm. rather than just continually the current got dispersed and that energy got dispersed. Not enough because a mile and a half downstream, we lost houses. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a that's a fundamental difference between fluvial erosion flooding and floodplain flooding. Yeah. yeah. Now, what about that? The feds don't seem to even recognize that there is such a thing. They, well, when we think about flooding, we think about inundation. Yes, that's what the feds think. That is yeah. accurate. Yes, even though seventy to eighty percent of damages are not from erosive flooding. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there was some, we recently had someone who sent me that we are the fourth highest per capita in disaster spending from the federal government. I believe that. Yeah, it was some outrageous number and it's largely due to flooding. It's an outlier number. Yeah. The numbers aren't outrageous or unhealthy. You're, <laughs> you're right, four is a really reasonable number. <laughs> um, I have a quick question on, so, uh, the, I understand the whole framework we're talking about all makes sense, but uh, not but and practically speaking, I'm trying to think about when you look at conservation work going on now, as it might be influenced by the bill, we're including uh, the, the aspects that you're talking about. What would we see as changed practices? I mean, is it that land itself gets conserved and then the management of it changes? Or is it there's land being conserved now, but it's not being managed in a way that is um, most supportive of the health of those systems? I'm, yeah, I'm happy to take a stab at that, but I do want to um, elevate something that Secretary Moore said in her testimony last week, um, acknowledging the America the Beautiful initiative um, that you know sets goals for lands and waters, 30% targets, that it's intentionally vague, the language, uh, so that the actual planning process that's going, that Mr. Mark will speak to in a bit, um, can really pull in the different stakeholders, impacted communities, experts in the field, et cetera, to really grapple with what it is that we mean and what the opportunities are. We did, because this question came up uh, rather frequently in the House, 
uh, in the last month or so, TNC did do an analysis, uh, pretty thorough geospatial analysis on what it would look like if you were just considering water conservation through the land that buffers it, uh, which would be a good first step, but it is uh, definitely insufficient to protect uh, and conserve our aquatic habitat. So it, it would need to be, uh, we would argue, uh, above land. Sure. Um, and is that, so I, I suppose that's the purpose of having the inventory yeah. process first. Yeah. And we have some language that we'll share around the assessment of the aquatic part of that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other committee questions from the judge? Is there a Nature manages rivers. <laughs> um, humans sport manage. I think I'm going to say that was very well said. <laughs> we do for the anything that we do to try to uh, change river or riparian flow and networks uh, typically backfires. Uh, and then one more thing, just because it, it won't be shared in the consensus language, is the um, the request by Dr. Wempel um, and those of us at TNC that the the language in 2802, the goal section, include explicit mention of water because that's currently missing. Okay, great. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, on that, I'd like to turn to Mr. Martin. So, thank you again for uh, being willing to take. The abuse of being point man on behalf of the stakeholder group uh, and helping corral all the stakeholders and mediating uh, or leading and contributing to a, a, the development of a consensus document. So maybe describe what we're looking at and uh, walk us through it. Please. I'd be happy to. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I just, I don't know if it'd be helpful to share my screen as well so others can see what we're walking through. Uh, so fast, he just had a pencil and muted himself all in like the last second period of time. That's... I've been practicing all week. Uh, for the record, my name is Trey Martin. I am the Director of Conservation and Rural Community Development at the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And it's my pleasure this morning to be with you to walk through a set of recommended changes to H-126. Um, these changes represent a, a consolidated view or a, um, a, a shared recommendation from BHCB, my organization, from the Agency of Natural Resources, who I think you'll be hearing from later this week and from the different organizations that comprise the Forest Partnership, including the Nature Conservancy, um, as well as Ms. Bergman, the uh, Vermont Audubon, the Vermont Natural Resources Council, uh, the Trust for Public Land, Vermont Land Trust, and am I leaving anybody out? I think I said Vermont Natural Resources Council, but definitely not to be, not to be left out. Um, uh, the process that we engaged in following uh, testimony last week was we, we met several times as in, in separate constituencies and then together through the weekend and, and, and late into Monday to get this draft to you. Um, so this is a, uh, as the chair said, this is a consolidated draft. And I will walk through all the, the changes, whether they're small or large, um, and I will ask for a lifeline to Ms. Oates um, as needed if you have specific questions about the language related to waters. Uh, page one does not have any changes. It keeps going to change to page two. You can see the change in line four there. Um, I think it's self explanatory. Uh, we're talking about changes in land, water, and sea use. I'm um, just going to get that slightly larger. Um, on page five, there are two new findings suggested in the consensus draft. Um, both of these were um, spoken to by the SOTS and Ms. Berkman. I'll pause there if there are any further questions about those findings. Those are on lines five through 10. Not, I will keep going. I think we should do these. 
<laughs> I'm just noting this is going oh, this, this you get thumbs up along the way. Thumbs up for me. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Um, <laughs> on the page four, which I've noted. Okay. I can just yeah. want to say that's good. I'm a perk. <laughs> You know, to page five. Um, I appreciate that very much. And, and please feel free to shout out support more questions <laughs> as we go through. Um, the first, we're getting into the, um, out of the findings and into the definitions section here on page five at lines uh, 13 and 17. You'll see that there's a recommended strike through the words of land, natural land cover. Um, not because this the consolidated recommendation is it's not to focus on natural land cover, but rather because there's a new definition below of the word conversion, which captures that concept. So I will come back to that in a moment. Um, top of page six in definition three, natural resource management area. You see that same strike through of natural land cover. And then a recommendation to change the, there was a definition, long-term sustainable forest management which we're recommending to change to long-term sustainable land management, which comprises more areas of the land that are part of the conservation programs that we all implement. At line four, you see that new definition of conversion, which means a fundamental change in natural ecosystem type or habitat, natural or undeveloped land cover type. So that's that language that was stricken above or natural form and function of aquatic systems. Can we pause on that uh, piece and can you just explain what that phrase natural form and function of aquatic systems entails? Is that physical plus functionality or? Physical, functional, chemical. Um, it, it speaks to or it comprises the testimony that you just heard yeah. about how we protect the land, how we live on the land affects all of our water systems. Um, not just where we're conserved or not conserved, protected or not protected, but then the management and use of those lands. Um, to the point that was raised about hiking and the impacts that hiking could have or when you begin hiking. I remember many years ago when we were working on the Lake Champlain TMDL, there was a campaign to get folks to acknowledge the shared stewardship obligations we all have around water. And it was called The Lake Starts Here. And the campaign was just to get, make people aware, I think mostly while they were skiing, that wherever they were on a ski mountain, the lake starts here. But I would posit that wherever you are in a forest, wherever you are in downtown, wherever you are, the lake starts there. And so everything we do on land is going to have an impact on the waters. And I think that's my way of answering that question. I would turn to Ms. Oates and see if she wants to add something less anecdotal. And that was so fun like, to watch you feel that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I guess I would just add that you'll see that there's a strike through for morphology uh, and a change to form and function that's uh, pretty much inclusive within morphology, but it's more accessible. And it's also the way that uh, the Agency of Natural Resources, uh, DBC Rivers Management Team, considers and manages rivers and state rivers and waters. So, new. For a change definition from sustainable forest management, we have recommended to change to sustainable land management, which means the stewardship and use of forests and forest lands, which is where the definition had been, to include grasslands, wetlands, riparian areas, and other lands, including the types of agricultural lands that support biodiversity in a way and at a rate that maintains or restores their biodiversity, productivity, regeneration capacity, vitality, and the potential to fulfill now and in the future relevant ecological, economic, and social functions at local, state, and regional levels, and that does not degrade the system function. Can you uh, explain uh, what that means a little bit? Agricultural lands that support biodiversity. So there's many forms of approaches to farming, and I don't know if that would sweep in all, you know, half of a low percentage can you help us gauge what ones we're entailing in this and what ones we'd like not be including? Yeah, in my, in my testimony last week, and certainly I may not have, have been as much in depth here as I was in the House and in BHC's testimony, but we spoke a lot to the, the farmland conservation program that we operate in conjunction with partners like Vermont Land Trust, Stone Land Trust, the Valley Land Trust, and those two in particular work with us to conserve a lot of farms. Those conserved farms are not just the fields on which we 
grow food on which we graze livestock or which we you know uh, produce hay they are often um, significant portions of those parcels are wooded significant portions are wetlands significant portions are riparian corridors and so the conservation work that we do often goes um, very far to support biodiversity connectivity species passage um, often at often with protections that, that far exceed state regulations around the use of, of, of those lands. Um, so in other words, we want to make sure that as we're planning, that we're taking a really hard look at the ways that our all of our programs, but but including the farmland conservation program, contribute to connectivity and, and functioning landscapes. Um, there's, a, there's some new language below, we'll come back to this in a minute, that suggests that in our process that we would spend a little bit of time defining what we mean there further and bringing in the experts and the folks who actually are you know at the land trust out working with farms and farmers um to suggest what what specifically the criteria would be for lands that contribute to biodiversity um, i think the same would be true on a lot of a lot of protected working lands that we have to be very explicit about the management practices that are are good for water that are good for that biodiversity thank you Big changes in definition six, which I'll read to you just like I did with definition five. Um, this is the definition of conserved, which is at the heart of this bill. Um, conserved means permanently protected and meeting the definition of ecological reserve area, biodiversity, conservation area, or natural resource management area as defined in this section. That's all the language that came to you from the House for purposes of meeting the 30% goal in section 2802B in this title. This is where the changes begin in earnest. For purposes of meeting the 50% goal of section 2802B of this title, conserved prim primarily means, that's a very important adverb there, primarily, means permanently protected and meeting the definition of ecological reserve area, biodiversity conservation area, or natural resource management area as defined in the section. And here's the here's where to focus. Although other long-term land protection mechanisms and measures that achieve the goals of Vermont conservation design that are enforceable and accountable and which support an ecologically functional and connected landscape may be considered. This speaks to the testimony that the HCB has offered, that Agency of Natural Resources has offered, that Audubon offered last week, and that the Forest Partnership um, supports that as we push towards the 50% conservation goals of land and waters, that we will consider a range of tools, not just state ownership or private land easements, but long-term endur enduring contracts, uh, deed restrictions, permit conditions, things that protect that land in perpetuity, or as this says, um, long-term land protection mechanisms. So, so things that have the quality of of, of long-term protection that, that won't come out of protection without a lot of process, without a lot of notice, without a lot of opportunity for us to make sure that we mitigate any loss of biodiversity that might be occasioned by that. Sure. Would that include something like you saw your appraisal current use? Not, I don't, not as current use is currently operating. It's on certainly a major focus of the planning process. It will be a focus of our inventory work. We'll be looking to see how much of the 2.3 million acres that are, are enrolled in that program, forest acres, are currently conserved. Um, but the current use program, which is a terrifically successful, really important conservation program, is susceptible to removal of lands if owners are willing to pay the land use change tax. Um, there may be ways to strengthen that program. There may be ways to work with landowners in that program to, to, to further conserve or protect lands. Um, but, but we would not say that that's currently included. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think perhaps you, I know Secretary Moore and Commissioner Snyder in the past talked about, you know, uh, lands enrolled through current use, although not permanently protected. It was sort of a feeder program for other efforts that followed to more permanently conserve or for permanent conservation. So they might sort of dip their toe in the water for current use, appreciate keeping their land in the state that that entails, whether it's production, and then go on to conserve after. So I don't know if that's sort of a, a major feeder program for the work of VHCB or not. But, I don't know that we consider it to be a feeder program, but I certainly recognize, and I think it's a very useful, uh, the way that Commissioner Snyder used to refer to it, the conservation ladder, 
of yeah. working with landowners through voluntary stewardship, use value appraisal, enrollment now in the new, the reserve category in, in use value. Um, and then there are those who want to go further to permanently or, or in perpetuity protect through an easement. Um, and that's certainly, you know that there are a lot of landowners there who understand the land ethic and the ethos that we have about protection, which is so important. It's why we have so much of our land and forest cover now or in production of food is that we share that history and culture of protection. Um, the, when Secretary War was in, a, she spoke about a concern of if, and uh, perhaps this provision addresses it, she'll be in on Friday so we can ask her directly. But since you're speaking uh, on behalf of the coalition, I suppose while we're here, here now, does this address her concern around quality and quantity? Mm -hmm. and the, the, it sounded as though the permanent conservation only. Um, was constricting in a way that might uh, compel conservation work that would be of maybe less uh, critical because there wouldn't be a tool to allow you to distinguish uh, the basis of quality. You know, that kind of I've gotten in trouble before saying I think what the secretary means is. Um, so I'm not going to speak for him. That was your job. Um, that, that was an informer life for the former secretary. But um, I, I think that this bill and, and this section now speaks to both the quality and quantity of what we're seeking to protect. That the you know the clear, there are obvious and clear and and and. Um, really a lot of the goals in here for 30% and 50% protection by 2030 and 2050 of land and waters. Quality comes in in the form of the, you know, the reference here to achieving the goals of Vermont conservation design. Yeah. It, it comes in the form of the, the new language that comes in around the protection of waters and aquatic systems. Um, it comes in, it will come in the process and the stakeholder engagement of thinking about the ways to prioritize our investments over the next 30 years so that we're really, we have limited or we have finite dollars each year to invest in conservation land protection and we want to, we want to identify those key areas each year that go first. Um, we also have to work with building landowners who, who want to engage in that process. And so even using the, the conservation design as a tool is, is helpful, but um, we have to consider a lot of other, a lot of other quality measures. Um, like how are we doing this around the state? How are we how are we tying this to other planning tools we have like basin plans or TMDLs? How are we how are we tying this to current use? How are we tying this to other quality programs? Yeah. Um, you mentioned the primarily. So can is, can you define it for us? Does that mean literally like fifty one percent or greater of the work needs to be that? Uh, you know this approach. What is primarily? How's that? What role is that playing there? I think primarily is uh, significantly more than fifty-one percent, but not all. <laughs> <laughs> the primary means the principal and and main focus of of the work is protection and perpetuity. There there will be. I showed you the slide of the the conservation project in Westmore when I finished last week, and I told you the story that it took thirty years. And, and three different landowners before we were able to put that into permanent protection. Um, and But there was protection all along and it would, took different forms up to the point that there was a conservation easement. So that would be an example of where there are other, other tools, understandings, ethos that, that protected that land. Okay, great. Um, any other any questions before we go on? All right, great. Thank you. I think the uh, the language in 2802A that you see there at line seven, uh, we've just spoken to uh, with Ms. Oates, so um, adding the concept that, that the vision also supports watershed health. On to the top of the next page of 2803. Um, we're getting into the process. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I did just have one piece on 2802 section B. Um, yep. I'm wondering about the, if we should be saying total land and waters in that section, just as a note. And I'm wondering if that has been considered. That was discussed and it was not part of what the consensus draft came forward with. That is something that even though the consensus draft may not have come forward with, I would like to see potentially. I can maybe just kind of go through and see if there are other places. Yeah. 
So um, where was it? Can it you would be, point out the line number? It would be it? line 11 and line 12. It says Vermont's total land area and then state's total land area. And I'm thinking maybe we put and waters. Or water, but I can't remember. Michael O'Grady had said water could be plural. So speak of the waters of the state and the waters of the United States. Um, land. I'll let Ms. Oates weigh in as well because this is an important question. Um, the reason why this settlement's total land area at both 11 and 12 is that we're taking in what you call an area based approach. Mm. Is that right to the way that we're conserving and that there's a we are talking about investments that protect the areas that are adjacent to waters that are in their watersheds that are um, that contribute to all those factors that, that Ms. Bergman and Ms. Oates talked about and I talked about that, that what we do on the land matters. So this is about prioritizing conservation action on lands that then support watershed health or aquatic systems. I thought that maybe I misheard or misremember um, that Ms. Bergman said um, that some international protocols don't have you counting the area of the waters that you're including. That sounds correct. Yeah, so what uh, Dr. Bergman and I both said in testimony is that the terrestrial components <laughs> are incredibly important. Uh, we've done some of that geospatial analysis and we can provide some of those numbers if helpful, uh, but that's only a, a first step and that it's insufficient <laughs> for actual protection of biodiversity and aquatic systems, which is why in the the definition section that Mr. Martin just shared, it says form and function, yeah. um, so that it can't just be uh, lands. And so the recommendation from the Nature Conservancy and Dr. Rumble at University of Vermont would be to include and waters okay. in this section, which is um, in alignment with the language for the global community as well as American Beautiful. To add and waters. Then, yeah, yeah. As, as Senator White just mentioned, I would say Vermont's yeah. lands and waters. Okay. So, uh, well, let me. Um, I thought this was a consensus document. So, I'm making um, a separate suggestion. Okay. Well, I think Dr. Rumpel's suggestion was, was not part of the discussion with the, the group that I met. That's something that Ms. Oates has, has shared on behalf of Dr. Rumpel. Okay. All right, so let's flag it, keep going, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, can I just add, I don't think that if that inclusion is at odds whatsoever with the language that we have agreed to. We've agreed to form and function, we've agreed to assessing our audit and habitat, which we're going to do. Um, and testimony before you last week agreed to or recommended that we keep the language similar to that we see in that agreement. So just uh, uh, the glaring oversight that Dr. Wumble mentioned. All right, so let's keep reading on. Yeah, so we, we get in the top of the next page in section 2803, we come to the um, process sections here. Um, and the, the recommendation here at the top of the page is to recognize the process that BHCB initiated last year in partnership with Agency of Natural Resources and other land trusts and um, public land managers to begin this work. Um, so it just it reorients the language from the secretary shall with the assistance of VHCB to the VHCB in consultation with the secretary shall. There, there, there are core, two other corresponding changes throughout the, the bill. Okay. Bottom of page eight and top of page nine is language I alluded to earlier, um, which suggests that when we, when, after completing the inventory of lands already protected, that we would speak to or we would we would bring back um, criteria to assess or to determine the types of agricultural lands that qualify as supporting and restoring biodiversity, and which would then count towards conservation goals under the natural resource management area. Thank you. Our changes in um, this is these are deliverables in the first report under the inventory. So at the bottom of page nine, um, sort of mandate number six is um, I'm going to read it again because there's a number of changes here. So I'll try to read it as it 
as it would be, um, a review of how aquatic systems are currently conserved or otherwise protected in the state, including a description of the benefits land conservation provides for aquatic systems, whether this is sufficient to maintain aquatic system functions and services, and how the implementation methods for achieving the goals of this chapter using Vermont conservation design as a guide would include specific strategies for protecting aquatic system health. Changes in seven. Um, not, it, it, this ties back to the change to um, the 2050 goal. So instead of saying the permanent non conversion conservation goals, this says how existing programs will be used to meet the conservation goals of this chapter and recommendations for new programs, if any, that will be needed to meet the goals. Bottom of 10, here's another, this is the second of the three changes that I noted, um, orienting the process towards a uh, VHCB in consultation with the secretary. And then throughout this section, we've added, where it says meeting the goals established in section 2802, we've added the words visions and goals so that it's, that we're, we're tying back to 2802, which establishes both a vision and those specific numeric goals. The vision, which includes the quality, it includes the ethos and the, the, the process that we're going through. So you'll see that a couple more times, but I wanted to just explain why that's added in here in 2803, or sorry, 2804. So you see that again at line five on the next page, the vision and goals. Bottom of page 11, the third of those changes that I mentioned, VHCD in consultation with the secretary shall hold 12 or more public meetings to solicit input from stakeholders. Top of the next page at line five, adding watershed groups to the list of stakeholders. Vision and goals at line 10. And then this is a, a recommendation from the agency that you all support an appropriate, which the partnership and VACB support is an appropriation to ANR um, to, to support capacity within the agency to, put, to help co-lead this effort. That's a, that's a request of 150,000 to, to hire a limited service position that would work with the agency and with VACB and partners over the course of the next three years. Okay. That's, that, I would note that's a single year's funding that is not enough for the agency to do this for three years right so our is this uh, even through the drill line appropriation is this a one-time money position or this is really a base base budget it's a limited service position so it's not it doesn't need to be built into the permanent base budget um, but, but that's a certainly a question that secretary yeah. moore is the right person to answer yeah. Okay. And that's, that's the end of the consolidated draft changes. Thank you very much. Any questions? So I think I'd like to double back as a question that you would send the light um, and water. So, um, Yes, and this would be page seven, line yeah. 11 and 12 of the draft. Um, so this, this um, did you say it came up in the conversation in the, whatever, the working group that produced this document? We did talk about it and we went back and forth, I believe, and I, I really would like to, to invite Ms. Oates to comment too. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I think what I said earlier was that we talked about conserving acres of land that throughout this bill we're talking about the impact of waters, the protection of waters, aquatic systems, watershed health. Um, and, and so I don't think there's a, you know, this is not to suggest that we don't have goals specific to protecting the waters of the state, um, but that in this goal section where we're Providing these numeric goals that we see that we focus on the areas of land that are both crucial to biodiversity, to connectivity, to landscape function, but also to watershed health and aquatic system health. But I, I don't know if I'm capturing the full nuance of our conversation, and, and Mr. Fidel is here, who's also part of these conversations. So I would seek to see if anybody wants to amend or add to that. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think this is just one of those like fundamental um, 
which means we that we didn't reach consensus on this. Um, that, you, that you did not. That we did not. That there is sufficient evidence that shows the benefit to waters uh, for land-based conservation mechanisms. Um, there's also sufficient evidence to show that it is insufficient for full protection of our water biodiversity and health, which is why the recommended language in the inventory, a very long one uh, that Mr. Martin just shared, uh, said that an inventory around aquatic system health would include uh, reference to the support that land provides for aquatic health, but whether or not that is sufficient that ties back to the goals. And I'll, and I'll add that the language throughout the bill talks about using Vermont conservation design as a guide. You look at the, the vision of that tool is to provide um, ecological connectivity and functional health for the state. And within that, it includes uh, explicit reference to water, the waters of the state um, and the different attributes that make our waters healthy. So I just want to, um, you know, goals are a statement of values by this body, and to to leave out explicit mention of waters will continue us down the path of only looking at terrestrial based conservation for watershed health. Okay, um, so I think where I'm a lawyer, so I'm losing a little bit of the connection. Since waters are held in public trust already, are they by definition conserved or not? Under in the eyes of the law. In the eyes of the law, they are conserved as defined in this title. Now. Okay. Uh, well, I don't think I'd like to understand that one better. I mean, in a way, I thought because we held waters in public trust that they they are by definition serve maybe i'm just not fully appreciating what we're capturing or not capturing the this other piece that goes along with it is how does it change the math of getting 30 percent if we add all the, the 23,000 miles of streams and 800 lakes and ponds to our math it depends on how the planning process is going to be led by DHCB plays out. Watershed groups will be there and they can come to consensus on doing just the land based approach. And again, we did the analysis on that. Um, that that could and would work. It would just be um, a couple of tiers below what we would consider to be like truly conserved on these systems. Um, and what's the relationship between conservation? in upholding the Vermont water quality standards. What's the relationship between saying that we have Vermont water quality standards and we're obligated to follow those as a delegated state um, in declaring water to <clears throat> serve? I would argue that would be part of the, the review. I'm sorry, I think we landed on review, not inventory language. Are you looking at that? Yeah, it's, it says a review of how aquatic systems are currently conserved or otherwise protected, yes. including a description of the benefits land conservation provides for aquatic systems. I'm at, I'm at page 9, line 16 at all, um, including a description of the benefits land conservation provides for aquatic systems whether this is sufficient to maintain aquatic system functions and services, and how the implementation methods for achieving the goals of this chapter using Vermont conservation design as a guide would include specific strategies for protecting aquatic system health. I think it's this, this language, this process language, this is the language that Ms. Oz was just saying, we, we have a very um, sort of long-term planning process that will kick off as, as we finish work in this body, um, that will come back to you all twice and in which we'll be providing this you know this review and an assessment of, of what what are the strategies what are the priorities how do we prioritize investments which are generally not investments in in the purchase or the, the specific acquisition of the water itself but in the protection of those areas that are most impactful of it and and then what else, what else is happening in the state because it says how else are waters protected so how do our basin plans and our TMDLs, how do the NIFTES programs that we implement, how do the, um, the, the many, many tools that we use to regulate discharges, how do those contribute? 
How does the you know the, the shorelands program at ANR? How does the wetlands program? How does the river corridor program? How do each of those contribute? So we have a really full understanding of what we should prioritize, where we should focus, where do we go first when we're making those conservation investments, which generally are of parcels that might include frontage on a river, frontage on a lake, wetlands, from area quarters. Right. So for me, you know, I'm speaking, I'm not comfortable making the change without quite fully answering the question about how our lake waters, public waters, conserved or not conserved, what's the difference between conservation is named in the bill versus what we already do, what the relationship is from our water quality standards, and how it changes the math about what 30% is and what 50%. If we add them in, are we, um, to be clear, all waters of the state conserved by definition? Are we going to add um, five percent, and we're at thirty-one already? You know, and I don't want to get stuck on numbers. I just want to be mindful of what we're choosing to do by changing, by adding the words. That's all. Chairman yeah. Donald, you have. It goes back to what the Senator Watts was pointing out. When we make definitions. Um, you know, we're dealing with you know, water quality and or whatever and we call things we, we define discharges as um, not existing when water flows in, into our streams that's how we regulate we declare things legally to be what any scientist or physicist would say you folks are nuts. Yeah. That's what we do. And then we say if we have regulated discharges into streams when we have defined what's going into streams as not being a discharge. That's what we do. For purposes of this section, X means. Yeah, for purpose of this section yeah. to regulate conservation, stream degradation, yeah. the behavior of stakeholders. We define things in such a way that um, contradicts what we say we are, our goal is, or makes our goal um, difficult, um, impossible, somewhere in between. To um to be realized, that's what we did. Senator Mike, uh, thank you, Chair Bray, um, and thank you, Senator Donald. Um, so I yeah I do feel so I'll just speak to my values, and my values in this bill are really well reflected based on the changes that was made by the consensus group. However, if we're going to actually push as far as we need to go, this bill doesn't get us there, and. I think that anything we can do to inch it a little bit more towards actually getting to where we need to be to protect the species and the habitats that we're talking about is a win for me. However, it sounds like there's not enough, at least from your perspective, there's not enough clarity on what the potential impact of that change would be. And I think that that's a fair comment and concern. The only thing that gives me comfort um, that might be helpful as you think about it is my understanding is the public trust doctrine doesn't cover surface waters. I mean, that's, or, you know, like that's, or it does cover surface waters. It doesn't cover the other things that we're talking about. So I, I believe that there's a gap at least between our definition of what's covered in the public trust right now and what this would cover. And it sounds like this would be more expansive. So that is where I feel a little more comfortable with it. Although it sounds like we there wasn't even consensus amongst the stakeholders. So I would be happy to take a break on this if we feel comfortable with everything else. Um, that would that would be yeah, I think fine you me. know, my concern is that um, we had a process, we included everything in that process. My understanding until this moment was it was a consensus document. And when uh, you know, you only have to get 
one thread loose on a sweater to unravel the entire sweater if you just pull it. So uh, a little concerned process-wise to make a significant change that the group did agree to and I want to understand why we're writing the bill, yeah. not the group. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So we need to take the test yeah. right now. I would say um, there are significant enough questions I'd like to understand like what we're doing if we're going to go ahead and make that change. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think anytime we ask a group of stakeholders, experts to come up with to, to work together to come up with recommendations to us. I think those recommendations have a great deal of weight mm -hmm. as persuasive evidence. I think they are not dispositive. Ultimately, we are the legislature, we write the law. Yeah. Okay. And we're responsible for it. So, but I do, so I, I want to show high, high respect for the work of the group as persuasive, but not as dispositive. In other words, we're not bound to do what they say. That's what we, we ought to look at it real carefully. Okay. Uh, the, the other thing is my understanding, and I may be wrong in this, but my understanding of the public trust, that that does not necessarily mean that something has to be conserved. It means it has to be used well, used responsibly. And, and we, we have, we hold it in, the, in behalf of the people, okay? And then we have the trust, the trust is actually, the, we're trustees for the people of the people's water. That doesn't necessarily mean you can't use it. It means you have to, you have to use it well. I've been playing for the last 15 minutes in my mind with the idea that the waters are covered by how we're defining conserving the land. Hmm. The part of the definition of conserving the land includes water. I've decided that I was wrong on that. I was had the thought, I was exploring it. And the, because we do stuff directly to water that is not just runoff from the land. We, we dump poison into the water to kill no <laughs> water. We run, we meaning society, we run big, heavy ballast boats, create waves <laughs> that chew up the underside of the sun. Um, we do stuff to water mm -hmm. directly. And so I think I would be more comfortable if we explicitly mentioned water. Mm -hmm. I don't think the implicit protection is that. <laughs> Sir McDonald, and I think we're going to need to move on. We'll get counsel in here so we can get a legal opinion on the okay. underlying questions. Talked about living next to clean, clean, cleanest uh, White River, where, uh, <laughs> and uh, which is a great place, great water, clean water. You can swim in it, but you can't drink it. Um, well, you probably yeah, could. Just, I think my kids did all the time. No, I'm just, <laughs> just playing that. That's it. <laughs> Um, so the difference between clean water that you can drink yeah. and the clean water that you can drink. That's our dilemma, mm -hmm. not that's not a criticism of yeah. the senator's characterization, but that's the inherent contradiction when we say that this is what we want to do, and then we don't have to cut our, mm -hmm. put our feet in cement uh, one way. Mm -hmm. I want to run them on. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Yes, thank you. Um, just so I um, respect the, the work of the uh, the group that put this together. Um, appreciate the attention that's being given to uh, aquatic systems in this, and so it it feels like you know it's it's all it's all kind of there, but at least for the goals. Um, you know, I, I also appreciate that there are these questions about um, what does it do to the math? Um, so wondering if it makes sense, and this is something that I'm happy to talk about with, with folks or whatever, but um, wondering if it makes sense instead of waters to say um, water connected land areas, right? Because it's, I guess I'm trying to think of like what's in, what's out. 
anyway, happy to. So this scoping discuss. question has kind of haunted us from the beginning. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What was in, what was out, how do we count, how do we define? So, um, but we'll get, I think we'll get our council in to help us sort out the, the, yeah, that the would legal be. questions I think in part that we're asking. Um, I'm also, Mr. Martin, last word to you and then I'm mindful of time. We have one witness to visit with us before we break and go to the bottle bill process wise. Um, I scheduled a vote on this Friday thinking, what if something came up? Uh, for discussion? <laughs> so, um, it's not amazing to me, something has come up for discussion. <gasps> and the plan, I think it's great that it did. It, this, if you honed in on a really important question that we welcome, it's, um, I think that the secretary will want to address this question as well. Yeah. Um, and being the administrator of all those programs, um, and I guess I would just you know, end by saying that it's, we really want to think about the, you know, what we do, the investment we make and how it's going to make these, the impacts that you all are talking about. And that's why the, the process point that, that report back that, that on page nine, line 16 is explicit about how do land conservation practices affect, you know, aquatic system health. Um, we will, before we even go on to then saying what our conservation plan is, what our priorities are, we're going to do that that study and, and bring that recommendation back to you all. And then before we go out and do any kind of you know investments based on that plan, we're going to have that plan in front of you as well. So there's a, there's a sort of a lot of process going forward that that you know if we can't there's all this completely in the next couple of days. I would point you to the you know this is a, a multiple by any. Uh, um, you know, process yeah. followed by 35 years of actions to get to the goals. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. 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 Anyway, thank you very much for letting me visit with you today. Thank That's you. Cool 35 years. Yeah. I mean, clearly the committee is very interested in supporting the quality of waters of the state. It's just we forget, I feel like we want to know what we're really saying if we make this edit. And right now, I, I wouldn't say that. Well, I would, I don't know that we do. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Gibson, uh, you had asked to speak with the committee. I did, thank you. And so um, we're running a little late. If you can uh, aim to provide your testimony in approximately 10 minutes, is that workable for you? And if you want to take a break first, and uh, no, we, yeah, we, have another, we have another bill coming up, so we another crew will be coming in. <laughs> Happy to have the opportunity, uh, sure, no, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so if you could just introduce yourself for the record, and uh, I will. Um, Jonathan Gibson uh, from Shrewsbury. Um, I'm here as an individual, I'm not representing any organization. Uh, nor am I here to take issue with any organization that's made presentations to you. I'm here because I, my understanding of what you're doing is allowing, uh, giving yourself the opportunity to have perspective, information that can help you produce a better product. And uh, that's why I asked that you come and visit with you. Um, I believe you have my testimony. It's on the website. It's two pages, 10 paragraphs. I'm not going to read it to you. <laughs> you have the uh, capability and uh, conscientiousness to, to read it yourself. I, I, I ask you to do so. Uh, there's a good bit packed into those 10 paragraphs. Um, I have a concern. <laughs> We heard 35 years of multiple biennia. That's my concern. Um, what you're doing is worthwhile, for sure. And I hope that it gets passed and enacted with or without the signature of the governor um, this year. It's not a piece of legislation that actually protects any ecological system, water, terrestrial, it puts in place as you're so well, an inventory process for July of next year, 
and a planning process for the end of 2025, which involves a report back to the committees for review. That won't be this, hope it'll be all of those of you present, but it won't be the same legislature. Um, and it'll be the second year of that new legislature. So pretty soon, if they don't get something done that year, it'll be into the next legislature. So we're talking four or five years before measures come from our legislative branch to the executive branch to do X, Y, Z. Um, a lot can happen in that time. And I am not here to uh, either to get into a whole new topic of what our agency of natural resources is doing. I'm going to offer you an example of something that I know very, very well. Um, and I think it may be instructive in terms of how you proceed. Um, in 2000, in the period 2000 to 2008, it took a long time to produce this document, which is a management plan for the Coolidge mm -hmm. West Management Unit uh, of the, uh, uh, in Shrewsbury, Plymouth, and Minden. Um, public comment was submitted then asking for creation of an ecological reserve. Um, we've been there since 82, raised our daughters in Shrewsbury. Uh, know the Coolidge Forest quite well. Um, I, the comments were, uh, I submitted comments uh, as early as 86 about ecosystem connections in, a, in the northeast part of that forest where there was the finest stand of um, woodland that I know anything about on public land in, in the state. And I spent a lot of time out of natural resource management background long ago, uh, focusing mostly on forestry. We've conserved our own property in my family's, my wife's farm uh, in perpetuity. Um, one of those, in 1990, there was an explicit request for establishment of an ecosystem reserve on this area to the Commissioner of Forest and Parks. You know, one individual, no organizational inputs, just let's say, or buy in. Nothing happened. Uh, what did happen in terms in those terms of, of resource protection, ecosystem protection, biodiversity, um, safeguarding. Uh, what did happen was in 21, the state uh, forest and parks department um, had a timber sale. 180 acres, uh, half a million board feet are being logged, have been logged. These are these are big, big old trees, uh, old forest. That's a, a natural community type um, that has so many values, as you know. Um, it's not there anymore. Um, these are these are 80 to 100 year old trees, 28, 30 inch. These are big, these are big, big trees. Um, um, there was some local concern. Um, uh, a request was made in public uh, access, uh, access to public records. Uh, we got uh, one of the questions was, what have you done with respect to carbon calculations? How much timber is coming out? How much carbon is being taken away that is not going to be storing or sequestering? Uh, how, how are you complying with the Global Warming Solutions Act? The answer, as I said in my testimony, was quote unquote, no responsive documents. So things are happening to fragile and finite resources. Now they will continue to happen. What do we do? Um, individually or as a collective body. All I can think of is to have some provision, a do, the do no harm provision at the next to last paragraph or the last paragraph perhaps of the testimony that I submitted suggest um, such that the legislature directs a and r which is the principal landholder and manager 
It's 360,000 acres. We were told last week's testimony from the department. Um, take no action that will preclude the designation of areas, deserving areas, um, as ecological reserves or biodiversity conservation areas. That's all I can suggest. How you, where you put that, I don't know if it's a new section of 2805. I'm not an attorney. I've written, worked on legislation for a long, for other, other contexts. Um, I'm putting the, the, the problem that I see and the challenge out, out to, to you late in, the, late in the game, but without something here loss of ecological resources will continue. Um, you can't really affect what happens uh, that much on private land. Um, what the nonprofit organizations that are doing such good work in, in conservation do, but you can affect what our state agency does. And I, I think you should certainly give consideration with your legislative council input um to just to, to, to addressing this gap this hole that this good legislation still leaves un, unfilled that's wow. that's what i'm trying to convey thank you sure sure so thank you and you um so i don't have your testimony up and um did you write any language hey, I know you're saying you're not a lawyer, but did you write anything that's sort of, you know a layperson's expression of what you're, if you were editing the bill, what you might add to it? And uh, yeah, a lawyer would go over it, but um, did you craft any any language? Uh, how did I know, Senator Bray, that you asked me that? How did I know? <laughs> I asked I asked that question pretty regularly. Why not get something out of these witnesses? <laughs> well, because you just um, have well, some language. Then no, I don't. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> it's not right now. All right. <laughs> we might need it. Um, well, no, so I, I, I intentionally, yeah. I intentionally decided I wouldn't go down that road prior to meeting with you yeah. because I, you know, I, I don't know that I trust myself. Yeah, you have better heads perhaps than I want this one can offer. I, I would be willing to, you know, send you something, but um well it's not it's, it's a tough nut to crack and yeah. and and and, and, and ha you know uh, you just went over this long examination of the percentage of the resource that we're going to get to meet goals whether it's aquatic or terrestrial. Um, uh, this could open up a lot of uh, a lot of uh, questions about how it plays out. I understand that it may be that it's something that you need to do in a fuller review of state land management next year. It may be, yeah. But the bill is right here. It's moving. Sure. And forces leaving the barn. The reason I ask is because um, as we close in on finishing the bill. Um, it's always pushing all of us, <laughs> committee members alike. Exactly. We can't vote on concepts, we have to vote on language. Got it. And, yes. um, and then often I find from my own writing uh, that I don't actually know quite what I mean until I try to write it down. And I go, well, that's, <laughs> that's not quite it. And then I edit. Uh, right. and so it's often pretty helpful. And ultimately, we, if we were to modify the bill, or just to come back to this in the next session, having some take, sure, sure, sure. some draft. No pressure to like be a lawyer all of a sudden, but I think for myself, maybe other ones that we'll better understand. Oh, I, 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 if we see the writing. I challenge you. I, I'm happy to accept your challenge. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I'll just, I, whatever. You know, um, Senator Corman. Yeah, uh, the Coolidge Forest. That's a state forest, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So the Department of Forests and Parks has the authority over whether or not there's a lot. Indeed, sir. Okay, so it was, it was let me say the state allowed it. And um, often with public lands, there's the principle of multiple use. So logging has always 
Am I correct or not? You're correct. And on okay. private lands, too. Well, I mean, I, I, my introduction says that we're in the use of value program. We, yeah. just, we just filed a 10 year renewal for our plan with a forester, a forest ecologist, and that includes silvicultural activities. So I'm not, you know. So if I'm understanding, you're not saying that they. That, not, that there shouldn't have been any logging there. No, this was a bad place. It was a, it. it was the wrong place to do it. You had an, a potential ecological reserve easily accessible uh, to scientists, to the public, um, and 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 it was of high quality. It doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. I mean that's you know it's it's heartbreaking to me personally, but um, it's it's more than that. It, I, I'm not here. To, Proverbs Bill Mill. I'm here to tell you that these things are ongoing, uh, and I only know this far as I don't know what the timber management. There's another sale in Coolidge that's perhaps being planned uh, now. I don't know the ground. I don't know what there's. I don't know when they're going to have to put out the sale notice. Um, but this process is going on at all times. And again, that's not. I, I'm not here to talk about forest and parks per se. I'm, I'm giving this as an example yeah. that's on public land. Uh, and someone may say, well, that wasn't such a great example. Um, the, uh, they, they did some sort of review, but the forest, the, the, the person who was looking at, at this from a stewardship point of view, uh, we, the Freedom the uh, uh, Access to Records asked what review they had done. We have the map of where the, where the, where the uh, state employee walked. He did not go to the area that was at the heart of this rich northern hardwood forest which there are only 57 acres in, in, in that community type within the 19,000 of Coolidge. It's a very special, sensitive area. He never walked there. That was where they put their patch cut. I'm going to supply you with a few photographs just so you know what the guys, what the man is talking about. But but I also will try to get more significantly, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, I, I will, uh, I, I'll give you some some words. Okay, well, thank you for that. And I'll do it soon. Yeah. Um, last question to Senator White. Then we're going to take a brief right. break because we're scheduled to start the uh, next bill in two minutes. Uh, thanks, Chair Bright. I'd love to connect offline with you because this is in this is in Senator McCormick and I's district in Windsor, the Plymouth bit at least. Yeah, so oh, sure. I, I appreciate that you're going to bring us language on this bill, but I think we also have some comments that you've said today that we might want to address on like an individual level with this particular project. So perhaps we can Absolutely. separate those two yeah, conversations and we can no, work together. I those, just are, to those are those are out of out of out of out of committee. But thank you for coming. Delighted to, to be here. Today. So thank you for the opportunity, Senator Gray. Um, thanks so much for coming in and making the trip to Montpelier. Um, food for, uh, thank you for your other witness point. We look forward to anything else you want to share with us. Um, I've been around large cuts that have been in special areas, and um, you know, I, I understand from foresters the stories that are told yeah. about renewal, renewal of forest, etc. Also, the values. Yeah. Uh, it can be heartbreaking to see uh, a large old forest. Uh, I think it was the location. Front, front of your eyes. I think I think it I think it was where it happened. Yeah. Um, that that was 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 the concern. It didn't need to happen there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I, I didn't make a special long drive from, from Shrewsbury. I came to Burlington for my uh, only my granddaughter's two year old birthday. Oh, so, 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 you know, it's, it's multiple, multiple pleasures in, in, in this visit to the north part of the state. Well, oh. now, since I know you went to that birthday party, I'm not worried. I know that there was yeah. another good thing going on. Yeah, where's